Hello, everyone. I'm Dick Seidenspinner, Chief of Vessel Ops for International Seakeepers, and we gratefully appreciate you guys and gals participating in our second uh, webinar. The first we did in June, and we're looking at the numbers here, and it's greatly increased, and we gratefully appreciate the participation. Um, I'd like to introduce, we have Michael Moore, our Chairman Emeritus, Principal at Moore & Company on the legal side. Uh, we have Tony Gilbert, Chief of Programming International Seakeepers. And we're looking forward to having a great hour with you guys to get into vessel donation. And what I'd like to lead into how what vessel donations are all about, it goes back to our mission statement from 1998. Uh, Michael Moore was there in day one in its preservation of the seven seas and simplicity. Um, you can see more uh, on our mission slide, but again, it's preservation of the seven seas and we as a 501c3 are proud to promote the fact that we have been in business making a difference for 25 years and we are going to sound off significantly this year at Four Seasons with our 25th anniversary uh, function on, on the 25th of October. It's a Wednesday. Um, thanks uh, to everyone that's been a part of our world for, uh, for 25 years. Um, with that, I'd like to hand off to Tony Gilbert, uh, Direct uh, Chief of Programming, and I apologize, Chief of Programming, Tony Gilbert. Tony? Thanks, Dick. Um, so yeah, just to, to kind of give everyone some context, some background on, on our mission. Um, again, we are a 501c3 with a charitable mission, and that is um, to facilitate marine research, conservation efforts, and education. Um, and that is done with a direct link between that community and the yachting and boating community. Um, so what does that look like in practice? Well, if you're looking at the at a screen and, and you're seeing our PowerPoint there, you'll see a boat and we are tagging and working up a shark there. So that boat, um, it's not Seakeeper's boat. Um, that was loaned to us for about a week down in, in the Exumas in the Bahamas. Um, and, and that's exactly what, uh, what our scientist led expeditions look like. And so those, uh, you see there that are tagging that shark, um, those are scientists, marine biologists that, you know, they needed to get out to those waters to research that, that species, that subject matter, but they just didn't have the means to, to do it. Um, to the means to either charter a vessel or lodging or in some, in many cases, both. Um, so we we kind of step in and through our contacts in the yachting and boating industry, we uh, and, and and community rather, um, we help make it happen. Um, and uh, so we also have um, citizen science wherein we are getting. Um, oh, there you go. There are the the four bullets. Um, so, yeah, we have citizen science um, that is, you know, very similar. We're, we're facilitating research uh, projects with the use of uh, yachts and boats from, you know, donors. But um, in this case, we don't have to have the scientists on board. So that's become a very sort of easier way in for people that want to use their boat to do something good and something interesting. Um, they can always participate in our citizen science programs. Uh, educational outreach is something that uh, has become a, a bigger focus for us, and, and it really has grown in the last couple of years uh, exponentially. And so that is a basically has a, its own dedicated department right now. And in fact, um, our education uh, manager, Tony, she is out uh, conducting one of those activities right now. Um, so basically, we're getting kids, you know, K, K through 12, uh, or about, you know, six years old to 18. Um, that's usually the age range. And we try to get them out on the water as much as possible to give them a hands on experience into, um, you know, what what marine ecology is, is all about why it's important to learn about it. I, I think, you know, some science programs in our in our school system, maybe don't touch upon that enough. And, you know, 70, I think over 70% of our planet is water. Um, so, you know, definitely a big, big part. And we want to just kind of uh, shape those young minds and, and help get them interested. Um, and then uh, community engagement, that is, again, another pillar where we, we, we do it mostly locally, but basically that's where we conduct um, beach, island, 
and dive cleanups. So, you know, marine debris is, is a serious problem. I'm sure you're all very aware. Uh, I don't think any of us here who uh, go out on the water um, go out there and don't see some trash or litter floating around. Um, it's 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 a hundred percent for me anytime I'm on the water, unfortunately, um, and that that can be a serious problem. So uh, yeah, that's just something that we have been you know uh, very active in, and again in the last couple of years. Uh, and and you know it's also a teachable moment. We we're we're kind of assessing data on what is being found and how much of it, um, and so. Uh, you know, that that data can be taken to municipalities and other policymakers and say, hey, we got to do something about this, make this more circular rather than just linear, which is a thing is produced, it's used and consumed and then ends up in the environment somehow. Um, so again, um, in a nutshell, that was and is our, our mission and, and how we accomplish it. Um, and uh yeah, I, I hope that kind of illuminated a little more about who Sea Keepers is so that, you know, if you're ever considering a donation, that's what it's going toward. Totally, Tony. And, and it may to enhance what Tony was saying, what we're here today and what brought us together is vessel donation. And what we do to everything that Tony was talking about couldn't it couldn't happen without vessel donations. So obviously the importance of uh, everything Tony executes and oversees uh, oh, is and funded Dick, sorry, by I'm, vessel donation. Sorry, Dick, I'm seeing here our next slide. Um, and this is just to give you guys a kind of a, a bigger uh, picture again of, of what Seakeepers uh, has been able to, how we've been able to grow through vessel donation. We've been able to now support our more international uh, hubs. So we've had a, a Singapore totally. chapter since 2015, um, but in in very, very recent years, we've also um, had a presence now, an official presence in the United Kingdom, and now the South Pacific uh, based out of New Zealand, which we're finding is very, very uh, beneficial. Uh, you know, and she's, when I say she, uh, Melissa White, she's strategically placed in, in kind of a hotbed of research but it was kind of a blind spot for us for a long time. Um, so again, just to kind of touch upon how we accomplish our mission, um, we're, we're doing it on a bit more of a global scale now. Um, but again, that would not be possible without uh, your donations. So sorry about that, Dick, but you could take it on again. No, nope, no, nope, that's all. Just just emphasizing where, where we are. No problem at all. And uh one needs the other. So we'll transition into you, Mr. Razone. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Razone, Director of West Coast Ops. Uh, thanks, Dick. And let me add my welcome uh, to all of the participants. Um, before I get into the actual yacht donation process, I think there's some very important considerations that you should be aware of. Uh, first, uh, uh, up to about 83 cents of every dollar that we generate through yacht donations goes directly to the programs that Tony spoke of. Uh, we're, we're very, very focused on uh, the, the ocean and the betterment of the ocean, and uh, that's at the core of Sea Keepers. And uh, the yacht donation process is the lifeblood for these programs. It's important to note that yacht donations are very well recognized by the IRS with hundreds of precedents. I often get asked the question, is this real? Does it work? Am I going to have any problems? Am I going to get audited? Let me say with a degree of certainty that this is a well-recognized precedence, that we have an expert staff and headquarters that is very, very familiar with the process. And to my knowledge, there's not been a, a problem with the IRS uh, on any of our donations. So this is really a safe and well-recognized option for you to consider and to put forth to your clients. Another important point, uh, Dick and I, as yacht specialists, we're not brokers. We're not competition. Our job, our only job, is to support you and to ensure that your clients are completely satisfied with the experience, regardless of whether or not uh, the, the yacht is donated. So again, look at us as your support team uh, in every element of the process. Um, I think the it, one of the the most important the things that uh, we'll talk about today is the fact that the IRS allows donations to be re, uh, appraised at replacement value. And uh, this is a very, very important uh, consideration. We all know the, uh, the, the cost of these yachts has gone up over the period of time. 
And the fact that the IRS allows us to appraise votes at a replacement value means that you'll get a maximum benefit, a maximum tax benefit for your client uh, with this type of appraisal. Another important consideration, Seakeepers is a registered 5013C charity. Um, there are a number of charities that are popping up now um, in this whole donations arena. If it's not a registered 5013C charity, the donation's not going to stand up to the IRS. So that's a very important consideration, as is the element of experience. There's a lot that goes into uh, the process. There are a number of documents. There are specific requirements that uh, Michael Moore will speak of later. And if any of these are missed, there could be a problem. So it's important that you not only have engage a, with a 501c3 charity, but that you engage with somebody that has a great deal of experience. Finally, uh, the whole process is streamlined. Uh, we can turn a donation in 30 days or less. Uh, another important consideration. Next slide, please. Devon? Okay. Um, the, 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 uh, the yacht donation process, it's, it's very straightforward. Uh, let me begin by saying that there's, there's probably three ideal scenarios for you to consider as yacht brokers where a yacht donation might be a, a very, very good option. Um, the first is where you've got a, a, a disconnect between the owner and his expectations on the, uh, the price or the value of a yacht and what the market realities are telling him. In situations where you've got yachts that are list uh, that are lingering in their listings and they're not getting the activity, these kinds of opportunities are are ideal uh, for yacht donation. The second consideration is time. Um, if you've got a client that uh, wants out is is wants to move forward, has another boat coming, um, has a financial problem, and they want out of it quickly, again, our process can take less than thirty days. Finally, a situation where, where a client really wants to give back uh, to recognize all the benefit that they've derived for oceans or from oceans over the years and want to give back to a charity that's directly engaged with the ocean, which of course is, is Sea Keepers. So the whole process starts when uh, we engage with a broker and a broker has presented uh, the program to uh, a, a potential donor. At this time, we'll go out and we'll reach out to our certified appraisals and we'll get a preliminary approval, which represents um, the, the tax benefit uh, that the donor would potentially receive. It's important to note that when we do this, um, if there are improvements that have been made to the boat, and we can document those improvements, uh, both from cost and time, we can potentially include those improvements like new instruments, a bow thruster, whatever. We can include those in the appraisal to increase the appraisal. So if you have those improvements, we want to make sure we keep them. Uh, we want to make them part of the appraisal process. Once we get the appraisal back, it's presented to the owner. If the owner is interested, we'll then take it to the next level where we'll provide a non-binding LOI that basically stipulates the terms uh, of the uh, donation, including the commissions uh, associated with the transaction for the brokers. The vessel then will need to be hauled um, and the owner uh, will need to pay for this. The vessel needs to be hauled for an out of water survey and uh, this survey is, as is the appraisal, is at the owner's expense. Um, once the, the survey has been completed and the appraisal has been validated, uh, the Sea Keepers headquarters team uh, generates the necessary forms for donations and, um, and the process uh, moves forward. Just a quick point here, I've been asked about the, the donation itself. Um, this is a, a, a tax benefit that comes right off of the adjusted gross income line from a tax return. And up to 40% of that can be reduced in a single year with the rest of the benefit, if any, carry forward for up to five years. So it's a very, very real benefit. I can personally attest to this. I've don donated two boats myself. And uh, as I said, this, this uh, in a 50% tax bracket means that roughly half of the appraised value would go right to the bottom line as a net uh, gain for the, uh, the owner. Um, once the uh, donation is complete, 
Um, Seakeepers takes over and we're responsible. We take over all the carrying costs and we move on to the next uh, uh, part of the process, the end user. Next slide, please. Um, post donation, uh, we, we really uh, do not want to uh, carry these boats uh, for a period of time. And so we'll look forward to, uh, to generating a, a sale or a, what, what charter actually uh, as quickly as possible. Um, we're required to hold title for 36 months in order for us to maintain the integrity of the donation. And so we'll offer very, very attractive terms to a potential end user, as we call it, in what is essentially a lease charter arrangement, a lease purchase arrangement uh, for a, a donation. As part of it, we'll have to do in material improvements. And these improvements roughly represent 10% of the uh, end user pricing. And we can work with the, both the broker and the potential interested in a party in determining what improvements are made. And so again, we'll get the boat, we'll offer it as a very, very attractive pricing, and then we'll offer very attractive terms uh, for this 36 month period. And these terms are 40% down in cash, 40% spread evenly across 36 months, interest-free, and then a 20% purchase option at the end of the 36 months, also interest-free. So again, not only is it a reduced price, it is a, a very, very attractive set, uh, set of uh, terms associated with it. Now, since 60% of this is financed, any potential acquirer of a donation is going to have to go through a, a, um, a standard credit check uh, but uh, usually that would that's uh, not a problem for us. A final important point on this is that we pay the highest commissions in all of the boat note donation segments that I'm aware of. Seakeepers pays 12% of the end user price, whatever the price is that we agree upon for the, the lease option purchase, whatever that price is, we'll pay 12% to the broker that brought us the donation and 12% to the broker that brings us the end user. So it's an excellent way to not only satisfy your client, but make meaningful and significant dollars. Next slide, please. In a situation like this, really everybody wins. The owner gets a significant tax benefit. It's a fast process. It's a good cause. Um, and they end up, as, I think, with a very satisfying uh, transaction. Um, the end user, the, the individual that acquires the donation, they get a great deal. They get material improvements and great terms. So they're satisfied. Next slide, please. The broker, the broker wins. Um, they have served their client. Um, they have, uh, they have uh, completed a transaction. They've generated meaningful uh, uh, commissions, and um, you know they've avoided the possibility of this thing lingering, this boat lingering, and potentially moving on to a to another broker. So it's a win-win uh, from a broker standpoint. And finally, Seakeepers wins because we've got money that goes into our coffers that, as Tony uh, pointed out, uh, goes directly into the benefit of of our oceans and the betterment of our oceans. Next slide, please. I think it might make sense, and maybe the, all of this will become a little clearer, if I actually go over an example of a recent transaction we've had. I'm going to keep this very generic uh, for privacy concerns, but let me say that there was a 2019 European uh, Flybridge motor yacht, and this, uh, this yacht had lingered on the market for eight months uh, with a $2 million asking price. No takers whatsoever. Uh, it went through one price reduction at 1.8 million, and a second price reduction uh, down to 1.6 million was being considered. Um, I got involved at that time, and we sent the listing to our certified appraisers, and they came back with a replacement cost re appraisal. Again, based on replacement costs for that yacht of 3.5 million. At a 50% tax bracket, that resulted in a net cash benefit to the owner of 1.75 million above the price that they were going to consider dropping it to 
And also in a situation where we were able to complete this transaction in less than 30 days. So the owner moved on, was no longer responsible for the uh, carrying cost and actually got a net benefit that was greater than they were contemplating for a cash sale. Next slide, please. Now, post donation, and this is an important point, um, we needed to find a, an end user. And um, so we were looking and, and, uh, and identified an end user that was willing to take the yacht under the very attractive pricing and under the very attractive terms that I previously described. Um, somewhere in the range of a million to 1.1 million uh, as the ultimate asking price. Now, remember from your standpoint, that is the price that determines the amount of commissions that we'll be paying the donors. In this case, excuse me, the, uh, the brokers. In this case, the broker was the uh, individual that brought in both the donation and uh, the end user. So this broker was eligible for 24% of the end user price. Let's assume the low end of the spectrum and it's a million dollars we'd be handing that broker a check for $240,000. Needless to say, I'm sure that he would be doing backflips when this is completed. And so again, another win-win uh, for everybody concerned. Uh, that's how the yacht donation program works. I think it's a, it's a viable program, especially in the current uh, uh, yacht and, and boat environment. We know that the day's listings is increasing. We know that the prices are decreasing. We know that the number of sales are increasing, excuse me, are decreasing. And so this is just another tool in your toolbox to consider. We would encourage you to give us listings, send us the listings of potential donors to Decorai. Our contact information is readily available on the website and send us the listings and let us get you a preliminary uh, appraisal. There's no obligation. Let us see where it comes out. Maybe it will be of interest to the bro uh, to the owner and we can take it from there. So thank you for your attention. At this point in time, I'd like to turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Michael Moore, who's gonna talk to you about the IRS. Michael. Michael, you're mute. Michael, time out, mute. Can you hear me now? There you go. There you go. Um, I think that uh, Steve said, thank you, Steve. Um, as Steve said, this is a 501c3 um, organization. We have uh, uh, never had a problem with IRS. In fact, we consider them partners, um, and we've had a just a wonderful relationship, uh, maybe – 10 years ago, we had uh, like almost all organizations that are 501c3s that go through sort of periodic uh, audits. We went through with flying colors. Uh, we learned a lot uh, and uh, developed a meaningful relationship. I think that uh, we consider them a partner. Uh, we have a board certified lawyer, not uh, who is outside uh, the organization. She's with uh, the law firm of Fowler White. She's board certified in both uh, taxes and uh, IRS regulations and, and specifically 501c3s. If we ever do get a question that we are not 100% sure about, um, we, we consult with uh, this uh, attorney and she guides us in how to be, to be absolutely sure that we are structured the combination, that structured the transaction properly. We have that have it vetted both on the front end where the donor is donating uh, a yacht into the Seakeeper organization. And we also have it vetted uh, with respect to how Seakeepers uh, ultimately makes a, a, a transacts with what we call the end user. The end user language uh, we've we've used because, um, you know, in the maritime world, uh, you'll hear various terminologies that um, have to do with uh, that that party that's taken the full vessel uh, and all indicia of ownership, you'll sometimes hear it referred to as a triple net lease. That's actually a, a land-based concept, but it's a, but it is akin to a triple net lease. 
uh, and uh, you hear bare boat charterer, which is another combination or terminology in the maritime world that means uh, all indicia of ownership have, has been um, conveyed to the end user. And we have always um, observed all of the requirements of the IRS, specifically with respect to, uh, for example, the uh, certified appraisal that you see on the screen is the at the beginning of the donation. That's the donor uh, ob obtains a certified appraisal, one that's current within 60 days of the uh, donation. Uh, but we also, once Seakeepers obtains the um, vessel, uh, not once in our history have we ever not held a vessel for the three-year um, uh, period. The three-year period is specifically recognized in some of the Internal Revenue Service forms, and it's uh, it's generally referred to as a substantial um, intervening um, uh, ownership period, uh, which has been through case law and on the for IRS forms, as it turns out it means three years, a three-year hold period. Uh, that's the reason that we always um, hold these vessels for three years. Um, and um, uh, uh, the vessels that we do uh, uh, place into the hands and care of an end user, we also get these end users involved in the seeking permission statement. We do everything we can do to uh, be, to encourage these vessels to become environmental yachts. Uh, this is part of the second part of the analysis, the donor part into Seakeepers, Seakeepers into the end user's hands. We want them to be in activities that are part of the motion statement. Um, we've never had a problem with it, with, with, our, with the, own, the yachts that we own, but which are uh, placed out on these end user agreements. I think at present we have 65 vessels um, not not all of which are on end user agreements, but the, all of whom are related in some way to Seakeepers that have so-called loggers installed on board that uh, are assisting in mapping the ocean floor. Um, the these the, what you're seeing now on the screen is um, basically these are things that Seakeepers would like to see, uh, and, and I think it was fair to say that we want vessels that are in good condition, fully seaworthy, uh, and functioning. Uh, but you know we're we're flexible, and we 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 do um, look at each vessel uh, and the donor of each vessel uh, individually. Um, and uh, while we do not uh, get involved on the front end directly with the values determined by the the certified appraisers, um, we do of course abide by the IRS rules in terms of the. Uh, 8283 uh, forms and the 1098C forms, which are specifically directed to vessel donations. Uh, and during the three-year uh, period of ownership, when the three-year uh, inter substantial interval ownership period is, is, is achieved, these vessels are always fully insured, uh, both as to the end users on board as, as well as uh, insured uh, by seakeepers, with both parties being named as uh, insured under the under the policy, so that's uh, that's it in a nutshell. I will I'd be pleased to answer any questions you might have um, in the Q and A session that will follow. But at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Dick Seinspenner to uh, take it take it from here and summarizing the program. Good deal. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate that. And something I want to touch on that. Uh, when Steve was going through his dissertation, um, the importance of the brokers. 98% um, of our revenue uh, that is generated, that we have 17 vessels that are revenue generating right now. We have 23 vessels that are in our inventory that are used in a variety of diff different applications, primarily the ones that are not revenue generating are under Tony's program uh, on, on the programming side and that various science applications that we utilize them for their donated vessels and assets. But 98%, basically all of our revenue, sure we have friends of friends and that kind of thing that wanna make donations, but we depend on the brokerage world. Uh, the majority, the great majority of our business comes from, uh, from the brokerage world and we appreciate that greatly. Um, I just wanted to throw that in there. Um, and to emphasize again, what Tony said on the commission 
side of it. There are times when we will have a boat that comes in as I, on that two percent side of which I, which I, what I just described, and there are no brokers in it. But we'll have one to as many as that I've been around and been a part of five uh, brokers that have been involved. That's competitive. We don't like to do that, but uh, we like to have the boats come to us from the brokerage community, uh, come into us with an end user to minimize cost of carry. That's what I try to do on the op side. When we take a boat in, it is to our advantage to minimize cost of carry and uh, take the vessel in, have an end user, as Michael described, and, and it's good for everybody. If if we do have an end user, the donor's happy, we're happy, uh, the end user's happy for the next 36 months and then ownership in the 37th month. Um, very happy with, in, in summary, very happy with where we are this year and the activities that we have. We just recently took in a vessel, a uh, very nice 83-foot uh, cockpit fish, uh, sports fish, and very happy to have it in our fleet. Uh, we're sea trialing it uh, this Friday, uh, haul out on Saturday. We have an end user in hand. It's been in our possession for 12 days. That's 12 days longer than I just described, but uh it, it, as of 10-1, fourth quarter, that's the most active for any donation uh, outfit, whether it be houses, airplanes, or boats. But it's our most active time of the year. And very happy to say it's uh, we've had a spike in interest um, and very happy uh, with what's going on. Um, thank you very much for the brokerage side of things. I'd love to progress into uh, a solid Q&A session here. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay, so Vaughn. So if anyone has any questions and would like to put it into the chat or if they would like to unmute themselves and ask, this is definitely the opportunity to do so. I have a question. This is uh, Norma Tree speaking. Um, I, I think we all understand the, the true tax benefits involved for the original owner in terms of the IRS. Um, but given that we have a significant international presence, can you give me any indication about um, what you see aside from the opportunity to participate with sea keepers and contribute to ocean science research and conservation that we do so well? Um, any comments about um, how to inspire or motivate the uh, non-American uh, brokerage and ownership community to participate in this? I'll be, I'll be glad to jump in there. One of our biggest, thank you for the question, Norma. Um, one of our uh, most lucrative donations at the end of last year, um, definitely it needs to start with a donation as an American for the tax benefits that are offered to that individual from through the federal government IRS. But on the back end of that, uh, it doesn't matter the nationality for the end user. Um, it definitely makes sense, uh, the most sense for it to be donated by an American. But uh, we had a number of conversations in a couple of forums in Monaco last week about just that question, how, how can somebody that's Norwegian, how could somebody that's Mexican, Australian benefit from it? Obviously, we appreciate the philanthropic uh, effort on the front end, but it's most advantageous, again, to an American and the end user for the piece, the persons described, the nationalities described, it's most beneficial Um or it doesn't matter. I shouldn't say it's most beneficial. It doesn't matter what the nationality is to the end user. It, sorry to get off track, but I hope that answered that, Norma. I'd, I'd like to jump in here, if I may, just on a legal side. Um, it almost it really doesn't matter uh, the donor's nationality or the record ownership of the uh, the you know the uh, where the uh, what's usually a corporate structure where the record owner is set up in terms of um, like, is it an offshore company? Is it, uh, you know, where the, is the vessel located in Spain? Uh, the one, the one, you know, which is one that we did at the very end of last year, as long as the structure uh, is, is, is uh, approved and vetted ultimately to, to, to give benefit to the donor, 
if the donor wishes to have benefit under uh, by re reducing their adjusted gross income. But there are ways, legal ways. We always have our board certified tax lawyer uh, vet these things. But uh, it's it's pretty normal for the process to start with a, for example, a vessel held by a trust. But the trust then has to convey the vessel through a series of transfers to a U.S. taxpayer. Um, if a vessel is held offshore, it may be necessary for the offshore entity to convey the vessel to at some point to get it into the hands of a U.S. taxpayer. Well, these are legal things that, um, you know, basically don't don't confuse a, a Google search with how to do these things properly. Um, but we we defer to some tax tax authorities, board certified tax lawyers who basically approve these structures. But at the end of the day, um, if, if there's someone with a vessel they'd like to see donated uh, or consider the donation process, we can work with uh, the donor and the, do the, the donor's advisors, usually accountants and lawyers, to make sure the thing is structured in the proper way. But I wouldn't get hung up on the fact, is, is it you know, beneficially owned by U.S. national and kind of focus on that? We can, we can work yeah. on that situation. Yeah, good. Thank you, Mike. And that's the great thing of having more in company at the other end of the hall, obviously. And uh, we do have two uh, other questions on the chat. The first one is from Owen. How do you provide proof of actual use of the vessels for the 36-month intervening use period? You may handle that. Uh, I don't yeah, want to please. hog please. the floor. But, cause so so the, the way to think about the uh, end user agreement. The end user agreement. That word uh, is, in fact, a created terminology to be more uh, descriptive, and to get away from the confusion of of these various structures that everyone knows. But it'd be the question would be like, if you if you triple net lease a Mercedes, um, the person that leases it is the the lessee is also uh, an end user. Uh, and that they provide the drivers of the car. That's it could be the husband, it could be the wife, it could be the son, the daughter, whatever. But as long as they're insured, uh, there's no. This is this this end user is a de facto owner. They are a de facto owner. They are a bare boat charterer. They are a disponent owner. They are a de facto owner. They are a pro hoc we say owner. You even hear that uh, every now and then when lawyers want to charge more money, they start speaking Latin. So it's pro hoc we say it means for this time. So they're for this time, they're owners. So it's up to the end user to hire the crew. That's their, uh, that's their, um, you know, the option. Some, some, some end users uh, are crew heavy. We have, we have one vessel that I think the crew is 27, uh, 27 crew members. Uh, I think that's the largest one in the fleet, but I'd say commonly it's, it's basically the uh, an individual with a couple of crew members at most, but it's their decision. They are the owners. They hire their own crew. They buy. They have to abide by all laws, like immigration laws. You know, you're on a seaman's visa and all these kind of things. But the the end user is an owner, an owner pro hoc we say, uh, for the period for the three year hold period, which is thirty six months. Um, I believe Owen I, did his hand, so I don't know Owen if you want to interject um but norma did have a question to that and the question is what happens at month 37 yeah. i just following up on that um mm -hmm. uh, i was under the impression that during that three-year intervening use period that the vessel would need to be used by a 501c3 for uh mission related purposes before um the um property can be uh transferred to uh, an, another end user um, for sale. Yeah, so that's two, that's actually three questions. Mm -hmm. um, the first the first part of that question is that the end user who signs the end user agreement agrees on the front end that they will be the owner, pro hoc we say the despondent owner, the bare boat charter, but the owner for all purposes. Uh, they, they, that end user will have all indicia of ownership, but but two. One, they will not be the record owner. They will not have title. Okay, title is retained by sea keepers. The second the second thing is um, they have a purchase option. When Steve described the normal 
uh, way of uh, with the 40 up front and the 40 over three year period and then the 20 percent that 20 percent is exercising the purchase option at the end of the period now during that hold period that three-year hold period um it, it i think it, at least twice that i know of end users have wished to uh assign their interest in the three-year uh land user agreement and and we've we've never we don't object the sea keepers does not object obviously the assignee needs to be vetted but generally speaking the end user does have the option if during the three-year uh, uh, hold period they wish to convey their interest under the end user agreement to an assignee uh, but you use the word the third part of your question you use the word sale we simply don't allow the sale of the vessel uh, inside of the three-year hold period. We do that because um, uh, on, the IRS talks about the substantial inter intervening ownership period. Uh, it's, a, it's a substantial intervening uh, period, which IRS has defined as three years. That, that period has actually been, has been incorporated in the IRS forms. Uh, historically, they were not in the forums, but I think IRS just got tired of, you know, questions and challenges. And so they now make it official. If you hold the vessel for three years, you are good to go. You have you have met the requirement of sea keepers has met the requirement of substantial intervening ownership. And the last part of your question has to do with what does the vessel that is now in possession of the end user and now ownership is now in the end user. So you have ownership possession, but you don't have title. You have title at the very end of the three-year period. But that end user is now using that vessel, even though they don't come to an office or officially do anything per se. Uh, Tony Gilbert's role is to persuade those end users to, to, to live righteously by complying with the CQ permission statement. Again, it may be just installing a logger on board. It may be pulling a, 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 a net behind the vessel to collect uh, ocean plastics. It may be serving lionfish uh, for dinner that they, because we give them our lionfish uh, cookbooks and uh, encourage all yacht owners to kill as many lionfish as they can kill. These are they're predatory little bastards and they all need to be eaten. Um, and, um, yeah, and there's a host of other things that we do. Uh, you know, just, I spoke to a Jamaican the other day. They've identified the, the suntan oils that the, the tourists bring to Jamaica have degraded right. the reefs. So we give out, uh, hopefully we do, this would be Tony Gilbert's department, uh, they give out suntan lotions that are not toxic, toxic to the little fish that inhabit the coral reefs around the world. Um, it's a very simple thing, but we encourage all of these end users to participate in every way that Tony and his programming team can dream up to convert these yachts to become environmental vessels and to further the mission of sea keepers. All right. If let me jump in here from Kenny, Michael, I need while you have the mic, if I could direct this question to you from Kenny McCleskey. Uh, as this is treated as a lease, how does sales slash use tax apply? Okay, so I think I'm first of all, again, I think I don't know if I've made it clear in the last thing, but I'll lead into there. Um, that the only this is not a, these are not sales, these are not um, what are called installment sales, right? That's that these are these are end user agreements, and that if a sale occurs at all, it occurs at the very end of the 36 month period. That's entirely at the option of the end user. And, uh, you know, we admit that 90% of the time, 95% of the time, the end users do exercise their option to take title. That's okay. IRS is okay with that. But IRS doesn't like the term sale. They'll ask questions to determine, is it a sale? Meaning, can the vessel ever come back? The answer to that is yes. If they don't make their payments under the end user agreements, the vessel comes back. But the other question is, how, how, how is the revenue that is received by sea keepers from the end user end users, how is that how is that income treated? And the answer is uh, it's treated as revenue to the to the 501c3. And if it is um, 
deemed to be unrelated business income, taxes are paid on that revenue. But our objective, like any any not-for-profit, would be to have that revenue not considered unrelated business income. I think I have this right. I'm not a tax lawyer, but the the revenue, if the revenue is part of the mission statement of Seakeepers, it is revenue generated for Seakeepers. It is not a taxable event uh, uh, in terms of sales tax uh, attribution. Uh, there are other factors that go into sales tax analysis. 2205 is a sales and uh, use tax. A lot of other factors go in. Where's the boat? Where's it being used? How's it being used? These kind of things. But generally speaking, uh, if the end user is using the boat in a proper way, what we like to see, the income is not taxed to the 501c3, uh, the tax benefit of being a 501c3 is that uh, sales tax is not due. All right. Kenny, Kenny, I hope that answers your question. I know it's where we're typing this in. Um, Yvonne, you had another question and I'm not seeing it on my prompt. Um, could you direct that, please? I think uh, the question was from Norma, what happens at month 37? I think uh, Michael kind of covered it, but I don't know if it's something we want to reiterate after the 36 month period. That are you square on that, Norma? Uh, yeah, I think that I think that's understandable. Um, it, I guess really my question was, what happens if the interim um, end user does not desire to uh, take up their option to uh, keep the vessel, or can they can they redonate it to sea keepers? What are the options, Michael? Yeah, I think that uh, it's a good question. Um, we have, uh, as I said before, I think 95% of the time, uh, two things happen. The end user holds for the entire three-year period, which is 36, 36 months from the date of donation, by the way. So if, if, so if Seakeepers ends up holding the vessel for uh, six months, then there's only a 30-month hold period uh, remaining on the 36-month period. Now, what happens if a vessel... Um, goes be is held beyond the 36 uh, month period. This has actually happened uh, with for us. There's no law against it. It's just that generally speaking, we we anticipate that the end users will take title uh, after the 36 uh, month period. But for different reasons, people are traveling, they're overseas, whatever. Uh, they want to do their do the final turnover, the final closing uh, in that you know 37. 37th month or maybe the 40th month or something. We've actually had holdovers that for whatever reason wanted to continue uh, paying end user payments and and we're not ready yet, not ready to take title. No, no, no worries there as long as we can work that out. Okay. Um Steve Reox asked a question of donation without IRS requirement. Um we've actually had uh, donations from people in fact steve may have been involved with one of those it was a swiss lady i'm sorry they say the mine's the first thing to go but this lady from switzerland um did not want a tax deduction and she did not want any pr and she didn't want any recognition she just wanted uh see to make a donation to sea keepers and so it's as far as irs is concerned it's a non-event she was not a u.s taxpayer um but generally, we're pretty much automatons with respect to how we deal with donations. Um, uh, we would deal with, you know, if someone, we we, we have uh, several situations pending, I would say pending may be too strong a word, but they're aircraft. So one of the problems you get into when you read those forms, the, the um, 1096C form, it talks about vessels. Uh, so... In the event, we had, I don't think we've had an aircraft later, but there's some pretty significant aircraft out there that are sort of in play where the owners are deciding what to do. And frankly, I, I assume there's probably similar hold periods. Um, and But but we just haven't had to confront that yet. But we would bring in Elisa Wan, the, the board-certified tax lawyer, and start working with her to make sure everything was done in a proper uh, in a proper way. 
All right, sir. Um, anything else pushing uh, that we'd like to talk about? Um, I would like to roll into the fact if there's any other questions, I'll leave it up on the table. Leave it on the table right now. Uh, if not, we're going to roll into uh, conclusion of our hour. Thanking everyone, but before we do, any other questions? If anybody would like to jump in, please do. I, I I see two two questions on the chat room board. If I may, uh, Dick. Yes, sir. Um, I, I see one from Roger Hurd. Caveat emptor. I think that means buyer beware. Um, I I would say that's probably always a good idea. Um, that would I assume since we don't have a buyer, uh, I would on, I would say that one only comes in when the end user takes title. And can therefore be a oh okay so Rogers clarified Aircraft. the question. I know so little about aviation, uh, Roger, that I basically have deferred to the donor, the potential donor, saying I'll deal with it when the time comes. But I just don't have the luxury of delving into the subtleties of aviation law. Although we do some work at Morin Company on aviation, frankly, not enough to. Not enough to brag about. Um, and generally, it's just very straightforward buying and selling transactions, to be honest about it. Uh, we do have one lawsuit involving a fixed base operator. But the point is that if someone were to re approach us with an aviation uh, aircraft or uh, an aircraft uh, for donation, I would have to roll up my sleeves and call Elisa and start working on how would you do that? Because aviation world is totally regulated. There's all these uh, regulatory things uh, that, you know, that you have to keep all these records, all the books, the flight, the flight records. It's a very different world. So that's not, it's beyond the scope of this webinar. Uh, I think that Steve Riox says IRS rules don't apply if RS not involved in donation. That's absolutely true. If the, if the donor doesn't care about taking a deduction, it's just a straight up gift. It really does not involve uh, all the rigmarole of complying with the IRS uh, rules under fi the 501c3 uh, designation. Okay. I'm not seeing any more on the chat board. Uh, anyone else have anything to ask, say? All right, we'll move into conclusion. And and there is on the a question, Dick. I'm sorry about that. Yes, um, sir. So the benefits from the IRS only apply to a candidate who generates income. For example, I have a perfect kind of candidate for this, it's very similar to the scenario you provided on the slide about the European sport yacht thing. Uh, but we just ran into an issue in the past with uh, Steve Hamos, a local Fort Lauderdale guy, we have his Fed ship list for sale. We tried to go to the, the donation right, route and his CPA advised him that it wouldn't do anything for him because he doesn't generate income. He's well off, he's retired and stuff, uh, but he wouldn't he wouldn't be receiving the tax benefits because he doesn't generate income. Can you guys clarify uh, the candidate for this has to generate income or is this gonna be a gift? Michael, I defer to you. Well, I think I think Steve uh, Razon also understands it. You're basically the donation is like any other uh, so-called tax deductible donation. If you give a piece of art to the, you know, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Perez Art Museum, um, at on the front end, the donor is is sort of under the under a system. I I, I wouldn't call it the honor system, but it's a system whereby you know, they give a painting to uh, the museum. It's a 501c3. It's not about, um, it's about the donor's income, Sydney. In other words, the donor has to have sufficient income to for it to make sense. In other words, the, the example that Steve Razon uh, used uh, is the donor is in the 50% income tax bracket. I, I guess, uh, um, I, I, don't, I didn't know how high the, income tax brackets go. I thought it was somewhere around 40%, but I guess you could get to 50 if you work at it. 
But, you know, that's that's their accountants have to advise them. We, we really try to stay out of that. We tell them you need that these donors are told you need to consult with your tax advisor to see if this makes sense to you. Now, some people get it, get into a situation where they're so strapped for the carrying cost of the of the vessel that they they just need to get off them under it. There is no tomorrow for them. So, Steve, maybe you have a comment there. I, I was yeah. just going to say I've uh, I've encountered a, a similar situation. Um, there is no tax benefit, obviously, if there is uh, is no income, but it would be possible. And I have seen a situation where the owner transferred uh, the boat uh, to a related party that uh, had an income uh, that uh, that would benefit from the tax. And so, you know, simple answer, uh, no income, no tax benefit. But certainly the uh, the vessel in question could be ta transferred to a related party. Uh, that yeah. that might be able to derive a, a benefit from that, and I have seen that uh, uh, that happened in, in the past. Sydney, love to talk to you more about it if the interest is still there. Definitely, I'll uh, we'll we'll jump on a call, and you know, you guys can probably pitch this better than I can. So it's it's best that I bring one of you guys on the call and maybe present it to the owner and see if he's willing to 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 do this. Absolutely. I mean, we had one, we had one, uh, Sydney, we had one client that had a, you know, older boat. He was spending, um, about a million three a year running the boat. The boat was only worth a million, about a million dollars. So do the math on that. This is a man that says, look, I don't need to be hemorrhaging, you know, real money here. I just need to get off one of this boat. So uh, sometimes you run into that, but it fundamentally starts with the donor and the donor's um, tax position. If they're looking for a donation to see if it makes any, uh, any, they keep that money in their pocket, that donation money. They kind of keep that in their left side um, as, as opposed to giving it to the government is really what it comes down to. So they're kind of yeah. keeping some of the money um, and getting rid of the carry on the boat. I do see a couple of questions here, Dick, if I can, uh, well, how do you provide proof of actual use of the vessels for the 36 month intervening use period? Well, of course we assume that these, these de facto owners, which are the end users uh, are out there, you know, they're paying us and we, we we get paid monthly. So we kind of know that they're out there using the boats. Now, meanwhile, Dick Seidenspinner and Tony Gilbert, job those two uh, individuals it's kind of the same thing but they're trying to maintain relationships with these end users to make sure they're um, involved in seakeeper programming everyone has you have people that are devoted and committed and gung-ho and then you have people that are not so committed not so gung-ho but for example, I mentioned, and Tony can speak to this if he wishes to, the logger program, which is literally map, mapping the, the world of seabed. Um, you got We got 65 boats as of today that, that are collecting data. Um, so they're involved in the, in the global process. And since we only own 17 boats, obviously do the math, there's a bunch of boats out there just working with us that really aren't. Uh, under any kind of end user agreement. They're just people trying to help out. The only other question is how this is treated as a lease, as this is treated as a lease, this is from Kenny uh, Michaleski, how does sales use tax apply? Well, um, sales, and, sales and use tax, if you're in the state of Florida anyway, is, is uh, what's called 21205. It's two sides of the same statute, sales or use. If you avoid sales tax on the day of sale, you're still going to get used, hit for use tax if you use the vessel in Florida waters. So you have to get through that that analysis. But basically, if you're paying into a 501c3, the less what would be what AMI Kids calls it, the lessee, what we call as an end user, that money is not taxed. It, it should there there there's ways of it being exempted. There's a lot of different exemptions. For example, if the 501c3 is involved in a children's programming, AMI Kids is children's program. But if you're into sea keepers, we're yacht centric, we're environmental, we're you know we're in that regard. We also have children's programming. 
that that income is not taxed, should not be taxed. Sometimes it's partially taxed. The IRS sometimes, if they were to, I mean, the cases suggest that sometimes you have people that use vessels in certain ways, uh, part of the time, and other ways, other parts of the time. So it's it kind of varies. It's a little bit of a two twelve oh five analysis, which is to say, how do you apply a use tax to the use of a vessel? Uh, while it's being used by the end user who is not the owner or the record owner, I should say, because the end user is an owner, but not the title holder. Uh, but under C-1205, you then have to go through that analysis. For example, if the vessel is always used offshore, let's say somebody's in the Bahamas, that's where they have the vessel. We have vessels in the Bahamas. We have vessels in Mexico. We have vessels between the Balearics and Gibraltar. Those are not taxable situations because they're not part of any taxable or any place that has use tax or sales tax. That may be a little beyond the scope of this webinar, but it's related to the donation and how the end user, uh, the benefits the end user gets when they take a boat from sea keepers. Okay. Thank you, Michael. I'm not seeing any more questions on the general uh, chat box and um and we've exceeded, which I appreciate the questions, we've exceeded the allotted time by about nine minutes. But uh, should there be any more questions, you have five seconds to jump in. Um, if not, uh, one, thank you to everybody that participated today. Thank you, Dylan, Michael, excuse me, George, Tony, Yvonne. Uh, Yvonne is behind the scenes making everybody happy um with everything you see on the screen we have a survey that is screen uh slide 19 you could jump in um we'd appreciate you telling us what we did right what we did wrong so we can greatly improve on our next webinar additionally uh can go to donations uh at seakeepers.org in uh, additional questions steve and i will gladly get back to you as soon as possible on that, um, any questions? Um, Steve, anything further you need to jump in add to? No, just appreciate everyone's attendance today. And uh, we'll be running another seminar in November. So please uh, reach out to your fellow brokers and invite them uh, to, uh, to the next one in case they miss this one. And uh, again, appreciate the attendance. Back to you, Dick. Thank, thanks, everyone. We greatly appreciate the growth, the brand, what we've been doing with Seakeepers. We're very proud of it. Thank you for the support. Take care.